I kind of, I felt like I was at the top of the world, man. Like I was 22 years old. I had a million dollar company. Well, I, I was part of starting a million dollar company. We had over a hundred employees, man. I was making so much money. I didn't know what to do with it. I saw opportunity, mm -hmm. right? Because I don't think anything is ever good or bad. It's what you make of it, right? Because somebody, when there's war, somebody's making money. When there's peace, somebody's making money. So it depends on what your objectives are and how you're going to capitalize on it. But I saw opportunity and I saw a need. All right, so we got Clement. Where you from? Where you grew up? Uh, born and raised in Bamenda. What's that? Uh, Bambili boy, but born in Bamenda. What's my hospital? Bingo Hospital. That's actually, actually, proud of myself in knowing the hospital I, I was born in. Yeah, that's in that's in Africa, Cameroon. Yeah, that's in African Cameroon. Yeah. So when when did you move here? I came to the U.S. when I was twelve. Yeah. Real young. Yeah, real young, real what, young. What do you fall in terms of like siblings? You the first or? Numero uno. <laughs> always, always the honcho. Did that come like with some kind of responsibility or? That's a, that's a good way to put it. It comes with a lot of responsibility, especially being African, right? You always kind of have to be the one showing the example, uh, the, the mistake baby. <laughs> so it comes with a lot. Good things and bad things too, because you get the initial attention, right? Which kind of gives you the comfort and the peace of mind to kind of, deal with the adversity that comes with mm -hmm. the other expectations afterwards. Would you say like that shape, like, if we go get into it, like the person that you are today, or it's like... Absolutely, absolutely. Because I've always felt the responsibility that comes with being the first. Mm -hmm. And like I said, there's certain gifts that come with it as well, because you get to experience a lot of things before the others. Mm -hmm. And from my experiences, I want to make sure that everybody after me gets to, to do better than me. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to do... You say you don't want somebody following the same mistakes that you've done. So I always look at it that way, that... I have the privilege of going first and because I went first, I want to make sure you do it better than I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was like, like coming, coming like from Cameroon, Bamenda to like the United States, was it like, I'm going here to, in this greener pasture school work? What, what was like the, the mindset moving? Well, I mean, I can't kind of take away from the mindset I have now. Now I'm looking at it like, man, this was a scam, but it was a very eloquently put scam because as children, we look at it like, we'd go white man country. We are following bush now. Understand why they say bush? Because we are the ones coming to develop their bush into a city. But I didn't quite understand that back then, realizing that I'm leaving my home and I'm technically now a refugee. I'm somewhere else that's not my home. I look at it now differently from what I looked at as a kid. But as a kid, I was excited because America was mm -hmm. the closest thing to heaven. Mm -hmm. So it was like, I'm leaving this other people and I'm going to heaven. But now I'm like, man, I really just left my home. Did, right. you, did you realize that? Like... How, how long did it take you to realize that? <laughs> <laughs> I would say probably was a half of the plane. I felt what winter really was. Then, so it's, it's stages of unlocking. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you're peeling bubble or there's levels of that peeling. Mm -hmm. So it's like, first level was that weather. You're like, man, this is cold. Mm -hmm. Human beings are not supposed to live here. Stage two, you get to school, you discover racism, discrimination. Then you discover even just quality of food. You discover the differences of life between the two worlds and you're like man this is different and of course it's also the good things right like story buildings mcdonald's that was a big one so you then you then discover like the world is different yeah when did you go to school like high school uh i went to i can't even Tom, i can't remember i think it's thomas jefferson uh -huh. high school middle school in uh pg yeah yeah you graduated high school i graduated high school in frederick in frederick maryland so i i, I came to the u.s i was in p in Bowie. So from Bowie, I went to, um, that was still PG. So Bowie, I went to PG, still in PG, but it was more PG. Mm -hmm. Then from there, I came to Frederick. After like, like during high school and things like that, were you like, what was your outlook in terms of like what you wanted to do in life? Were, were they like some role models? You're like, I want to, I want to get into business. I want to, you know, get a career. Absolutely. What was I, think I definitely had very consistent on who my role model, my role models have always been. Uh, and that's why they say a two-parent household is the most important thing. My dad has been my role model from the day I was born. Uh, I think my dad, my grandfather, my mom, mm -hmm. my, my grandfather in a sense that like in my whole community, everybody knows about him. He's always had so many accomplishments. Mm -hmm. He was a vet back at the time when many people weren't doing stuff like that. He had a car, probably one of the, the first car in my village. So he just set so many examples and i'm named after him clement my name is clement sue mm -hmm. and his name was also clement sue so like 
that was always an example for me to where I never got to meet him. He died when my mom was 16. Mm. But just always, everywhere I go, they're like, ah, pass we picking. So it's like, that's the generational reinforcement of greatness that was always been in me. And then my dad, uh, probably the most successful man that I know, mm. just, my dad stopped school in sixth grade, but he's probably the wealthy, the, the most influential person as far as creating wealth that I've ever seen. So I've always wanted to be a businessman since I knew what anything could be. You because go to college? Because I've seen it happen. You go to college? I went to college. I went to Towson University. Graduate? To graduate, of course. What did you study? University, what, did they <laughs> what, did you, what did you graduate in? Uh, I graduated in international business. So business management, but a concentration in international business. How? So you, you would say that was influenced by your dad? Of course, yes. Because considering I came to the U.S., when I always was modeling, like building my master plan as a kid and I'm watching his moves, I'm like, so how can I do what he's doing? What can I study to do what he did? Because I always thought about it like Bill Gates dropped out of school. Well, I don't need to go to school. Mm -hmm. But my mom was very solid on you need to have that background. You need to have a backup plan. So I said, well, what can I do to make my plan follow his direction? Yeah. Right. And I realized that a big part of what he did was he always found things that were lacking in Cameroon mm -hmm. to explore our economy. Like he first started our business going to Nigeria, buying things in Nigeria and bringing back to Cameroon. So I said, well, how can I tap into that? Mm -hmm. And I know I have a strength in being from Cameroon. Mm -hmm. I can exploit the things that are lacking there in international business. So figure out how to bring, buy low, sell high. I feel like even way back in high school, college, you had some kind of business going. <laughs> <laughs> Man, what, was first, what was like the first business or you know something remotely close to a business that you that you had your hand in uh i would probably say let me count from when i came to america the first thing i was selling gum in school so yeah. i used to buy I, i'll go to 7-eleven so i first started by stealing gum so i apologize <laughs> i hope god has forgiven me for my sins on this nice sunday too mm -hmm. so i would i first stole like the first three packs of like wrigley's or juicy fruit any of those kind of gums that we had at that time i don't remember the, the one that had lebron on it yeah 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 so I, that was the big thing because lebron was just in the league then so I, I i stole a pack of those and i stole some juicy fruit and i'd bring it to school and i sell it for 25 cents a stick mm -hmm. so there's i think i can't remember exactly there's 12 inside a pack for the juicy fruit so out of 12 pack that's my profit, mm -hmm. right? And then once I sold it, I go back the next day, I buy another pack and I sell. So between every class, I would sell at least one pack of gum per class. Mm -hmm. And so every, every kid want to buy gum. And it was doing so well. I was making probably $7 a day Dang. selling gum. And it got so good to where I would put other people on. I'd come to school and then I'd give you mm -hmm. uh, like three packs. When you sell, you split the money with me 50-50. Mm -hmm. And then I got to a point where I had some big, Older goons come from home. They're like, "Yo, we need four dollars a day from you," mm -hmm. and I'm like, "I'm not giving y'all nothing." Mm -hmm. So I went and reported to the principal. Then they're like trying to get me in trouble for doing business in school. So that was the end of my thriving business for almost a semester. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fast forward to you know you going to Towson, the international business. Yeah. Did you ever like materialize that degree? Like, did you like go work, get a job in it, or was it like pointless? Or um. I think my last traditional job, well, up until recent years, my last traditional job, I worked at Walmart because when I was trying to graduate, you know, everybody as an African, we always have these, the saying or our families like, you must get scholarship. You don't get scholarship, you're a useless child. Oh, your friends are scholarships. So I was like, man, I don't know how to get a traditional scholarship, but I knew that Walmart was the biggest company before Amazon, Facebook, all of these, Walmart was the biggest company because of the logistics. And I said, if I want to be a businessman, I need to learn from a company that has a global footprint. Mm -hmm. So I said, let me go work at Walmart. Uh, and I also knew Walmart had scholarship programs that they gave for their employees. So I said, okay, I can work for them. After one year, I'm eligible to get a scholarship because, I mean, I've always been a C's, get degrees kind of guy. I didn't kill myself to get an A because <laughs> I just wanted to get the degree, right? So Walmart, I know if I do my one year, I look at it like, do your one year, you'll be able to get scholarships with them to then put that into your school. And I also learned how to do stocks from them. So my first stock purchase was as an employee. So I looked at it that my paycheck, 40% goes back into stocks. I'm doubling on my money. I'm also getting scholarships. So it was more learn uh, logistics, management, get a scholarship, learn how to trade stocks. Mm -hmm. I saw all the positives in it. Uh, but that's kind of my last job that I truly had. Uh, once I graduated college, my mom and I started a mustard seed home healthcare company. Mm -hmm. So right out of college, I was driving three hours every day from Baltimore to Hagerstown to go intern with another company so I could learn how to build our company. Talk, talk if you can, talk to me a little bit about the company. Because yeah. would you say from 
from high school, you know, the candy business? Was there any in-between business before that? Uh, so that, that's kind of a funny story to that also is I had, I worked in home health care. Mm -hmm. uh, so my mom was always been a nurse in home health care. And the funny thing that got me to home health care was actually because of a girl. Mm -hmm. I always said I wasn't interested in none of that, but there was this girl that I was really like mm -hmm. in love with. So she, I helped her get a job in home health care. Mm -hmm. And I realized I'm like, man, if I'm ever going to get a chance to get at this girl, I got to I got to try to work with her mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. So that's what got me in home health care, which ended up being a great thing for me because that's where the company that we ended up mm -hmm. starting out in that same industry as well. So I did work in home health care mm -hmm. in between that time period before then Walmart, which was long term strategy for me. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was in home health care for about three years. Y your mom was already in a nurse. Yes, she was already a registered nurse. And so she had, did she already have the business or she had the idea and then she brought you? She had business as well, because in Cameroon, my mom had a restaurant. She had, uh, she was doing a lot of different business entrepreneurial mm -hmm. ventures. Uh, like back in 2002, for example, when Cameroon was in the Olympics, they were the, my mom and my husband were probably the first Cameroonians that people saw in Dubai or Pakistan, mm -hmm. right? So they would always go there, buy things. The first cell phones that came out, like the Nokias, mm -hmm. we used to sell those in Cameroon. Mm -hmm. So my mom has always been a business person, but she had a nursing background. Mm -hmm. But my dad was like, man, you're not getting enough money doing this. Let me put you in business. So he kind of showed her how to get that done as well. So like, what was you like coming in the, 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 the nursing, the home health business? What was like your role in it? Uh, the money, man. I had to make sure that... so. The reason why I jumped into that field was I, when I looked at, in any business, there's the technical knowledge and then there's just the business side of it, mm -hmm. right? Like if you're a restaurant, there's the chef and then there's the person that handles the cash register, mm -hmm. right? So in home healthcare, there's the, the registered nurse who has the clinical administration and then there's the businessman, the man that handles payments, making sure that actual revenue is happening, right? Following the tax laws. So that's why I came in. I looked at it, I said, okay, if I want to go do business in China right now, I'm a 20 year old college graduate. Nobody's going to take me seriously. Mm -hmm. I need to do something to build my resume to where I can then start talking a million dollar business deal, something like yeah. that. If I want to be my dad. I can't just, it can't happen overnight. I need to take baby steps. Mm -hmm. But I saw my mom trying to go make a logo, copy people's stuff. I'm like, all right, you're going to get in legal trouble. And when I realized how much money you can make in home health business, mm -hmm. I said, all right, we're going to do this together because you have the technical expertise and I can bring the business expertise to complement that. So I sat down with her. I said, hey, I'm going to commit a good, I'm going to look at it like college, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to put four years into this business with you. So that way, by the time we build it up right, then you can help me also build some other things on my own. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably one of the smartest things I've ever made. Mm -hmm. Business to running, I assume. Yeah, business 10 years. 10 years strong. Wow. Yeah. What's, and you, and you did your four years with your mom. Yep. Four years. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> Knowing that in the back of your mind that if this, if this takes off, you, you can get some, some revenue. Right. It'd be the foundation. Yeah. What was it in your mind that you were like, at, like, I want to, this is, when I break off from this, I want to do. What, what was that that you had in the back of your mind? Uh, was, was it just like, I'm going to figure it out and go on? Did you have something It's like, I'm going to do this once I get out of here? You know, this business my mom. I think, especially as a business person or entrepreneur, you always have to have some level of positive optimism. Mm -hmm. You can't be too stringent, uh, stringent in your way of thinking, right? So I had ideas and plans. Like I mentioned before, even coming to do this with my mom, I had my own vision. But it's more that the vision is continuously ongoing, mm -hmm. evolving, ongoing process evolving. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to start somewhere that was more concrete and then redesign the features I go along. Was there anything like even back from like a kid, like looking at your mom, looking at your pops, that entrepreneur mind, it was like, this is the business I want to build, you know, where it's like a, a creating an app, like, or mm -hmm. like, you know, something revolutionary. Like, I think, you know, people who are entrepreneur minded, it's like, this is what I want to do. Yeah. I got some stuff I'm going to do to get me there, but this is what I always want to do. Was it like, sort of like for you like that? That breakthrough for me, I would say it happened more in college. I just knew I wanted to be in business, but I was always kind of still trying to filter where I felt I really belonged. But I knew that my passion, especially like as, once I came to the US, my, my passion was I need to do something that would improve the quality of life back home in my country. Mm. So it was more around what can I have the most impact in that kind of a sphere of influence in Cameroon. Mm. And that breakthrough for me came when I discovered Renewable Energy in 2000 and I think it's 2017. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Before, our goal is inconvenient truth. Make sure y'all check that out. We're going we're gonna to get into that, but yeah. I feel like this this more... Of course, yeah, I, just, I, just, I had to step to that because yeah. I know that's what you wanted me to yeah, kind of yeah, get yeah, to. Yeah. Yeah. So after, you know, you, you leave with moms and mm -hmm. you still kind of, you know, you still, you still 
always going to be part of that business. Yeah. What was next for you? Uh, next up from that was I started trying to figure out my own identity, mm -hmm. which is kind of where I was alluding to with Renewable Energy is that once we started building the foundation of that, I said, okay, well, what is my true identity? Mm -hmm. And actually, now that you mentioned it, a little bit before that, there was this crazy thing that happened called the iPhone. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the iPhone just changed technology as a whole. Uh, I used to sell phones here in the U.S. and also in Cameroon. Mm -hmm. So now everybody looks at me, they're like, Mr. Green, but I used to be iPhone before y'all even ever had an iPhone. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just everything about the technology was amazing. But for somebody like me who's a very a serial entrepreneur, mm -hmm iPhone is so restrictive because they're a closed network. Mm -hmm. And that's why I truly can't use them anymore. But when they came out, they were so far ahead of everybody that it was where I had to be. Mm -hmm. And that's where I see Tesla now a little bit when I tell everybody a lot about what they're doing mm -hmm. because they're so far ahead of everybody. Don't waste your time with anybody until there's a lot of disruption. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of going a little back and mm -hmm. forth, not to kind of throw you off, but I was selling phones and electronics. Like back then we had this thing called MP3s. I know some of y'all still mm -hmm. younger. So we had MP3s and then you had your phone. So I was selling iPad, iPad, iPods, mm -hmm. iPhones, uh, MP3 players in Cameroon, and here in the US, that's when eBay was the real, there was no Amazon, it was mm -hmm. eBay. Mm -hmm. So you have to go online, buy the good deals, or go to this local stores in Baltimore, buy good deals and then sell it online. So that's what I was doing while I was starting a mustard seed where I didn't have a paycheck. Mm -hmm. Cause I would just be the one in the office every day, eight hours, no phone call, nobody coming in, no paycheck. While my friends had their salary jobs already, I had to make money some other way. And that's where I kind of started with that, was just flipping phones and, iPods and electronics in general. So you would you would actually go home um, to to like close some of these deals. Did you mm -hmm. see like the landscape? Yeah. Or were you like just doing it from here and like having? No. So I would go home every. So my goal was always I tried to make sure I went back home at least once a year. Mm -hmm. So that was a very big part of my goal was that I wanted to make sure I was I didn't lose my identity. Mm -hmm. So I would buy stuff here. When I have people going back, I send some stuff with them. And then when I had the chance to go myself, I take a bunch of stuff back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But in between that, I sold stuff here. Why, why was it important to you know, make sure that you go home at least once a year? Because I feel like that's something that a lot of people who are actually minded or just you know, have, a, you know, have a life in the world can don't invest in going home. Mm -hmm. Granted, some people don't have the means, and that's yeah. fine, but people who have the means don't you know, invest in going home. And also, what was it that you were seeing back home in terms of like the, the business landscape? Was it good? Was it bad? I saw opportunity, mm -hmm. right? Because I don't think anything is ever good or bad. It's what you make of it, right? Because somebody, when there's war, somebody's making money. When there's peace, somebody's making money. So it depends on what your objectives are and how you're going to capitalize on it. But I saw opportunity and I saw a need because there's a need because there's a lot of people that are not invested in our growth. Mm -hmm. Or even if there are people invested in our growth in Africa, especially in Cameroon, there's more people that thrive on us being impoverished. Mm -hmm. So I always saw it as it's my responsibility as a first generation. Like I said, I'm a first child and I'm first generation mm -hmm. from Cameroon. And I came from a family with a good history mm -hmm. and pride in our culture. So I saw it as my responsibility to make sure that I don't just be happy with what I got and forget how I can impact those who don't have those mm -hmm. opportunities as well. Yeah, that's, that's key. So, you know, you got the phone business going. How did that how did that go? Like, was it, was it good? Was it? It's still going, man. It's still going. Like I just sent 30 phones to Cameroon. Uh, I'm planning to send another 15 in about two days. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's evolving over time and it's taking less of my, my attention span. Right. Mm -hmm. My goal is in a few years, I should probably have my own phone line mm -hmm. and be able to build other technology behind that. Mm -hmm. Right. So this, let me, let me kind of keep that locked up a little bit, but there's a lot of more things that we're doing in that space. It's just, in business, it's always about continuously evolving what you're doing, mm -hmm. right? You can take the lessons from mm -hmm. me selling on eBay to now me building my own app and selling on that or me designing my own phone now. Mm -hmm. So it's just the vision changes and evolves with the way things are happening all around me. Mm -hmm. So after that now, I think you kind of alluded to it. You, you get into, you know, automotive industry, which is Tesla. Oh, yeah. Was there something before that? I feel like there, there was. Uh, so it, before that, it was really just... Now it was it was that. So mm -hmm. with, was home healthcare was thriving. Mm -hmm. I kind I felt like I was at the top of the world, man. Like I was 22 years old. I had a million dollar company. Well, I had, I was part of starting a million dollar company. We had over 100 employees. Man, I was making so much money. I didn't know what to do with it. I was ordering Hennessy by the box mm -hmm. to my house. Just the money, girls. Like it was everything a young man could dream of. Mm -hmm. So then I'm not a big car person. So then I was like, I, I, need to, I need to show off a little bit. I've been driving this 2000 uh, Toyota Camry 
was it Alexis at that time? I think it was Alexis. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, I need to, I need to do something now to flex. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I, I was trying to flex. I said, I want to buy something. I was thinking about a Maserati, but then I made a bet with a friend of mine, my roommate at the time, Jesse Anita. Mm -hmm. Shout out to you, bro. So he told me first person to get to a million dollars in assets or net worth. Mm -hmm. If he got there, I'll buy him a Tesla, a Tesla Model S. That's when Tesla Model S just came out. Mm -hmm. And I told him, all right, I see your bet. And if I get to a million network for you, you'll name your first son after me. <laughs> what? Hey, I, I had to give him something juicy, right? Mm -hmm. So when I, when I thought about it, I said, you don't have to give me like your first name. You can give like a middle name or like a 10th name, whatever you want to do. But you name your child after me. I'm glad he thought about it and didn't accept that bet because... It would have been bad for yeah, me. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm glad he did make that bet because I looked it up. I'm like, you know, a smart man, you can't bet something and not know what you're betting on. I'm like, what is a Tesla Model S? Mm -hmm. So when I looked it up, that's when I learned, like, I always thought about it, like, why don't we have electric cars? Then I'm like, yo, there's electric cars. Mm -hmm. There's a guy called Elon Musk. And I'm like, man, this is incredible. This is like 2012. This is 2013, 2013. And I'm like, this is incredible. Like, why is nobody talking about this? Then I started researching it. Then I saw more about solar panels. In between that point, there's always container business. So that's something I always did with my dad actively too. I didn't mention that part. But with container business, we would ship all kinds of things. So it's, I see it in a way as that's how we kind of recycle. America throws out their trash, but we use an opportunistic way to grow our own businesses. Mm. And through that, when I saw the solar panels, I'm like, this could be game changing for Africa. Mm -hmm. And I saw all the policies that come out of it because in Cameroon also we have crazy energy issues with energy shortages, grid failures all the time. Mm -hmm. People's equipment go bad because of grid failures. So I looked at it, I said, this could be a great opportunity with the right vision because electric cars are the future, mm -hmm. solar panels are the future. Africa is the continent with the most sunlight. Mm -hmm. This is literally what our civilizations need. And that's what kind of got me rolling down in that, in that space. So in the, in the automotive space, what was it, what was it, did you, who, who won the bet, first mm -hmm. of all? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's too many things, it's too many things, yeah. So how did you, because I know, and we've had, I've spoken to you in the past, where you had like a fleet of cars. Yeah. That you, you started kind of like a... Tesla Rosa. Tesla Rosa, yeah. when we, you know, renting cars. With Turo, and yeah. What, what was that idea, like how did it come about? So I kind of left a little bit off before that. So mm -hmm. once I got introduced to Tesla by my friend Jesse, mm -hmm. and then I got so enamored by it i said let me i tried to even go test drive and they refused i couldn't test drive because they said you're 23 you can't test drive this car unless you're 25 mm -hmm. and you need to put a down payment of at least five thousand dollars so i came back two months later with my mom and my dad and i'm like all right can i test drive now they're like no they can test drive and you can sit in the car so they test drove while i just sat in the car and i'm like i'm gonna buy this car one day and i was just so amazed by the car and so that's how it kind of really got started really because from there i just started planning and saving to see how i can get myself into one of those cars mm -hmm. once the business grew up and we we're in a better position my plan was all right i want to buy a tesla mm -hmm. i want to buy the big tesla tesla model x because the model threes were about to come out but the wait times were like a year you have to wait a year to get one so i said all right i have to make a gutsy decision if I buy, if I want to buy the Model 3, I won't get one in time to make money off of it. Mm -hmm. If I buy the Model X, I could then try to save up some more and buy a Model 3, mm -hmm. right? But I'm like, I don't think too far ahead. But again, as a good businessman, you have to plan and then try to see what happens. So I bought the Tesla Model X, waited three months for the order to come through, and then we finally got it delivered. It's 110000 mm -hmm. Man, my mom was looking at me like, you're spending like a house mortgage on a, you're spending, you're, this is a house, you're mm -hmm. a product. I'm like, Ma, there's a plan. This is the future of technology. I'm getting ahead of the game. It's, after all of that, too, it's like, you're just talking to, you're talking to yourself. But I'm like, I'm confident in my decision. Mm -hmm. And I've never felt like it was an incredible experience. Like, I got pulled over twice mm -hmm. by cops who just wanted to see the car. Because mm -hmm. they'd never seen. And I think the one time, to be honest, they thought I stole the car. Because to see a black man driving the Tesla Model X then mm -hmm. was rare mm -hmm. right? and i was 20 20 24 no 25 then i was 25 to see a black man driving tesla model x was something else uh so we got the model x i was renting it out for like a thousand dollars a day mm -hmm. so when i'm looking at the money coming in i'm like in two days i'm making my car payment i'm like this business model is incredible because i had so many people wanted to drive the car and i'm such a giving guy i didn't know how to say no so i was like how can i let people drive the car and cover myself in case they hit the car 
That's when I found Turo. So I'm like, all right, I'll rent it to you. But really, you're just paying so you can get insurance, but then you can drive it. Because mm -hmm. you're also not going to mess up my insurance. Mm -hmm. But that way, I'll say you rented the car, but really, you're just renting it so you can put insurance and you can drive. Mm -hmm. Then I started seeing like a rent it for proms. I, was doing, I did a bunch of proms, did a bunch of weddings. And then I said, all right, so this plan actually is working. Let's try to go get that Model 3. So the Model 3 was reservation because I have a Model X. Mm -hmm. They put me in front of the line for the Model X, for the Model 3. Mm -hmm. So there was... 400,000 people in reservations for the Model 3, but because I had a Model X, I don't want to buy a Model 3, I was able to buy a car the next month. So I walked in, remember the dealership I went to, and the guy was telling me, oh, you can't drive this car? This man is begging me now to come buy a car from him all the time. Like, mm -hmm. the, the respect flipped completely. So he called me, I called him, I'm like, hey, I want to come buy a Model 3. He's like, yeah, come in, we'll, we'll check this, we'll do that. So we ordered the Model 3, came in um, about a month and a half later, car was booked up every day car was rented out i had people flying from finland i had a customer from saudi arabia that came in mm -hmm. every every christmas they came from saudi arabia rented a model x it's like a thousand dollars a week for just that one too so like he was paying me up front like he gave me money three months in advance to come book the car mm -hmm. one time he said hey come drop the car off in new york we'll pay you an extra thousand dollars for delivery mm -hmm. but i just drove the car myself parked there took my hotel so it was it was a great time. I was definitely proud of that at that moment in time. Mm -hmm. uh, and then from there, again, like I said, I'm a kind of a giving person. So I reached out to all my friends. Mm -hmm. I think I talked to you about yeah, it at yeah. that time too. I was like, bro, we need to get a Tesla. This is this is game changing stuff right now. Because even if the business fails, bro, at least you have rented it for a little bit to where you've paid down the ownership of your vehicle. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was telling everybody. I'm like, look, success leaves a footprint, and just look at the footprint of what I've done. And even if not, you get yourself a brand new car. Mm -hmm. that you've paid down a lot from other people renting it out mm -hmm. and it's, it's fail proof mm -hmm. so we're able to get ourselves up to seven teslas at that point in time mm -hmm. and a polaris slingshot yeah. so we're trying to pivot a little bit and try some other things but that's when i realized like quality of the vehicle no car compares to tesla because up till now we're six years down the line and not one car has had any maintenance problems mm -hmm. anything that goes bad on the car is covered by warranty or insurance covers it. So you, I've never spent any money out of my pocket fixing a Tesla. Mm -hmm. So that's something you can't, you can't knock that. That's incredible because that also, is it, is it safe to say, you know, Tesla being an uh, electric car gave you the idea for renewable energy and, and solar panels and things like that? Because I know that's what, that's what you're heavily into right now. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's all what Tesla does, right? They're in solar, they're in electric cars. So with a lot of his footprint and then with a lot of my own studies now, I saw a lot of the different directions. But I'm a lot more niche focused now because, like I said, my main goal is how can I be impactful to Cameroon? Mm -hmm. And what Elon Musk is doing, he's changing the whole world. And again, sadly, the world doesn't care about Africa as much, even though he's African. But mm -hmm. he has to play the game the way the game is being played. So I'm trying to take advantage of the niche market that he's not focusing on right now, which is going to be the biggest market, which is motorcycles in Africa. Mm -hmm. And then decentralized energy. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he's going to come to that eventually, but hopefully I can make enough... Mm -hmm. uh, leapfrogs and, and progress in that space before I start facing competition from the biggest car so company in the world. you're talking like electric motorcycle, electric bikes? Electric, electric bikes mm -hmm. and uh, swappable batteries. Mm -hmm. So Tesla originally wanted to have swappable batteries in their cars, but that's not as fancy for Americans. Nobody wanted to sit down and take their battery out every time they wanted to do, like charge your battery. Mm -hmm. And America has long distances, mm -hmm. right? So like the average distance, just for you to come interview me today, I'm sure you took by an hour. Mm -hmm. So those distances are not present in Africa and Europe. So mm -hmm. their swappable batteries are more prominent or will be better. Mm -hmm. And um, the bigger batteries cost more money. Mm -hmm. In Africa, smaller batteries cost less money. Mm -hmm. So if you have swappable batteries, I can say a battery for a bike will cost you $100 because it's a very small battery. Right, but because you can swap it, you can just charge and replace, charge and replace. Mm -hmm. So you're not worried about replacing batteries because it's a small battery. But a big battery for a 60 kilowatt battery, to replace that, you need to go commercial power tools, mm -hmm. park somewhere. It takes you at least 20 minutes to charge that battery and mm -hmm. replace that battery. Mm -hmm. But swappable batteries is just like a power bank, pop in, pop out. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of what I've been doing with a lot of my travels recently, going to China, working with companies in Kenya, figuring out the landscape, I'm pretty sure I've met with all the top companies. Mm -hmm. Dominican Republic, I met with a company out there. Because many people don't know, Dominican Republic is the Douala of uh, the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. They ride bikes just like us, plantain tape just like us. Mm -hmm. Everything there is just like Cameroon, but with Spanish. Mm -hmm. So I studied their economy and how uh, transportation works there as well to see how I can extrapolate that to Cameroon. I work with a company there that's working in renewables as well. 
Uh, but I realized that they were more looking for me for investment rather than actual collaboration, which is what I was hoping to do. But I'm hoping down the line I can still work with them on some other things too. How many countries have you, have you, tra have you traveled to, would you say? Uh, in my current passport right now, I think I'm at like 15. What's, what's like the one country that you've learned a lot business-wise from? China. Oh, that's easy to work with business-wise. China. Oh, okay, maybe not easiest to work. Okay, easiest to work with. I guess, not sadly, but America is the easiest to work with. Mm -hmm. But China is a different world. They're not even a different country. They're so far ahead of everybody combined, it's not even fair. Mm -hmm. In what way? Technologically. Mm -hmm. uh, and just, just technologically, let's say it that way, because everything else stems from that. Mm -hmm. Like, you land in the U.S. airport, it'll take you at least an hour, 30 minutes to go through customs. Mm -hmm. China, a million people go to the airport every hour. Mm -hmm. Every hour. Mm -hmm. And you can go through that in 25 minutes mm -hmm. because they understand speed, speed, speed. America understands capitalism, capitalism, capitalism. Mm -hmm. So that's a big uh, misinformation that we see a lot here in America where they're trying to make sure that we don't help China grow. So they're trying to make them seem so negative. Every country has their good and their bad. Mm -hmm. But I think China's good outweighs their bad completely. In 30 years, they've taken 500 million people out of poverty. Mm -hmm. In America, you probably see the reverse happening. The middle class is dying more and more about it mm -hmm. as the time is going by. Mm -hmm. Our roads are getting worse. To go to DC, you see, it's taking you hours to get into DC, which is the capital of the free world. Mm -hmm. So there's no advancement because there's just bottlenecks and politics and corruption going on mm -hmm. rather than actual focus on growth. Mm -hmm. But China has to do all of that because they have 1.4 billion people. So they have to focus on constant growth. So I guess it's different objectives but that's why I prefer that economy. I just don't speak Chinese, so I can't live there. Mm -hmm. And I already have my own country to go back and change. So I want to be where my change, my impact is most needed. What's, what's like the challenge that you've ran into that has taught you the most in terms of business, you know, and how as a business person, do you, do you overcome challenges? Like, do you, like, how do you overcome challenges? Uh, being true to myself, mm -hmm. I think that's the most important thing because you can, you can know everything in the world. You can have all the money in the world, but the moment you start compromising on your principles, then who are you, who are you, or what are you? Mm -hmm. And I would say communication is the biggest thing because even like a perfect idea, even Jesus couldn't change the world mm -hmm. as we would quote unquote expect, right? Jesus was killed. Mm -hmm. So who do you think you are to expect that you also won't get scrutinized or persecuted for wanting to be a righteous person? So that's why I say communication because you can only try your best to communicate to the best of your abilities so somebody can understand you. Mm -hmm. But the moment they don't understand you, stay true to yourself and do, do, do what you have to do on your own. Mm -hmm. But don't, don't hold nobody to no standard that you know they can't live up to. What's your, um, what's your favorite quote in life or best advice that anybody has been giving you? I guess now, now I'm just going to be cliche and say the first thing that came to the top of my head. I'm going to shout out to Drizzy Drake. Mm -hmm. Know yourself, know your worth. Know yourself. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good one that's a good one I, I think that's the best one that I'll say that just came up to my, to my head right now because like I said the way you communicate is also going to be based on knowing yourself mm -hmm. and the way you let somebody approach you or the way you your compromise is by knowing your worth and knowing what you bring to the table because mm -hmm. a lot of times being the bigger man or being humble is about taking the short end of the stick mm -hmm. because you know your worth you know what you can deliver mm -hmm. you know that the shortcomings that this person is seeing you see more than that so you can accommodate for that Right? And that's why, like I said, about being the firstborn and being a first generation here in the U.S. is that I'm always constantly looking at, here, this is where we are. This is where we're from. This is what we should be about. Mm -hmm. right? You might be on the grass is green on the other side, but I'm like, this is what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. So I'm always going to have to be the one that has to make the compromise. Mm -hmm. sad, sad to say. That's what being a leader is. What is it about, like, what is it about you specifically as a person that's like, listen, I, I got this goal or this business idea and I'm going to, I'm going to accomplish it. Like, what is it about you that keeps you driven? Cause I feel like that, that's something that I pick. Like, you know, yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to keep evolving. I'm going to keep growing and I have ideas and I'm going to keep materializing them. Man, you're, you're a great interviewer, man. Cause like you're giving me questions that are just like, it's like you planned me to say something and <laughs> it's, it comes back to just knowing myself, mm -hmm. right. And knowing my worth, because there was a time when shout out to my boy, King K Kimbo, mm -hmm. Uh, that's one of the most influential brothers that I've had in my life because he's somebody too who's always known himself. And shout out to you too, man. Like you're one of those people out there. Like when I listen to you even rap sometimes, I'm like, man, this guy is rapping like 
he's not doing secular music like he's true to talking about god mm -hmm. remember we had that conversation one time when i was like bro i don't know how i can stop saying the n-word mm -hmm. or cussing and now i'm like the one pushing people on that mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying knowing yourself and being true to yourself mm -hmm. because then you can figure out where you need to move differently mm -hmm. and not just go with the wave mm -hmm. right because like and when i shout out kimbo is because kimbo was one of the first kimbo was a true cameroon booty scratcher mm -hmm. like and uncompromising to every extent. Mm -hmm. Like he loves his country, he loves his culture, and he'll always stick up for that. So I, I had a hard time reconciling with people like that when I came here because I was trying to rush to be with the crowd so much. And I'm like, wait, you, you're fine eating kati in front of people and sucking your fingers? Like, that's embarrassing, bro. Mm -hmm. And he's like, if you don't like it, I guess go your own way, but I'll be here enjoying my food. And I'm like, I like that, I respect that. Mm -hmm. And so that's really where all that comes from. Mm -hmm. You, I think I rushed to, to come here to do this today because in a couple of days you're going to stop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's business? It's always business. If you're doing, if you're a business person, you always, there's always an opportunity to be found somewhere if you're looking for it, mm -hmm. right? So it's always business and then pleasure finds its way. Or it's pleasure, but business will find itself in pleasure, mm -hmm. right? So I can't ever say anything is mm -hmm. one dimensional. What is it, like, if you, what is it that, that's in your mind right now? Because I feel like there is something that has not, that's like in the planning stage in your mind. Yeah. So right now, and kind of like what, when, when you came, we were talking about it. I'm a new dad, just like you as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not, now I'm an older dad. Yeah. But spirituality is a big mm -hmm. priority for me right now because mm -hmm. also part of knowing yourself is being grounded to something because now what you pass on to the next generation is just a, a spiritual foundation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a lot more of what I'm trying to revisit now to be able to know how I can lead my daughter the right mm -hmm. way, lead my wife the right way, lead my family the right way, is to be able to communicate them. I can't be somewhere all the time, mm -hmm. but if I'm not there, they're like, this is how Clement moves. Mm -hmm. Like you leave your spirit in a space where you're there, or when you're not there, people feel your spirit. They're like, if Clement were here, this would happen. Mm -hmm. So that's a big part of what I'm about right now. Um, and my mom is really, she, that's, that's her, her forte. She's my spiritual guru. Mm -hmm. My dad might be the business guru, but my mom is the one that holds us all down with our, our spirituality. Mm -hmm. I butt heads with her on, on it a lot because, you know, I'm new school. But definitely this is a big trip for us on a lot more of our spiritual groundedness mm -hmm. and kind of building on that. Um, I wanted to, like, you touch a little bit about the, the solo. Uh, I think you, you were working with a company the last mm -hmm. time we spoke about it. Yes. Uh, how can people like like get in on that if there's something that you know it's it's open on and things like that so solar is a lot more open now like for example when i did my first solar projects when i started doing i kind of skipped over something i was doing i did uh, student rental mm -hmm. real estate so i had rental properties that we leased rooms for students in universities mm -hmm. uh but when we did that i had solar on top of the homes and at that point in time to be a solar representative you had to have a degree in that field mm -hmm. but now with a lot of the mumbo jumbo going on in the background they just saturated the space and just made it a sales business mm -hmm. which is kind of why solo doesn't get the respect that it should and people just are looking at it like you're trying to make money off of me mm -hmm. is because it's just such an open market now that anybody can kind of jump into it mm -hmm. but i really tell a lot of people all the time is that that's probably if you have any iota of sales interest that's probably the best job you can kind of get because there's great money in it mm -hmm. and you're doing something that's changing the world mm -hmm. so I like, I like doing things that are making the world a better place. So that's, that's what kind of really rings with me a lot. But I work with a couple of companies because I'm always trying to see I can take knowledge that I can bring back and to model my own packages for Cameroon as well. Mm -hmm. But I had a couple of companies that I was a subcontractor for. Um, currently, right now, I'm with Power. Mm -hmm. So anybody needs solar, tap in mm -hmm. with me mm -hmm. and we can figure something out. So I do residential, I do commercial. I'm mostly in the commercial space right now because my time is so limited with so many things that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to do a solar project, I'd rather be making $100,000 mm -hmm. than doing a residential and make 10, mm -hmm. 15. So I do residential with people that I know and care about, mm -hmm. right? But most of the time, I'll go to Barbados, but I'm there to do a commercial project. Mm -hmm. Like I can do a project for a million dollars and I get $100,000 out of it, mm -hmm. right? So that's what my focus is really right now mm -hmm. on the commercial space. In, in terms of like, you know, trading, because I used to trade that. I still trade, yes. Yeah. I kind of stopped trading for a while, but I came back yeah. there and trade. Man, and you, know, you remember Battery Day, but I lost, <laughs> I lost 80,000 and 115,000 in two different accounts. And Golly. I just said, you know what? Between COVID, money burn, I was like, all right, I don't have disposable income to just put in places like that. But that hurt, that hurt, that hurt me bad. Yeah. It, hurt, it hurt for a while. In the grand scheme of things, were like, I wonder, like the, like a high, when you think of it, between, you know, 
uh, whether it's Tesla Rosa and trading and the solar and everything else that you got going on, what, what would you say has been like the most that you've controlled in your assets in terms of money? As far as valuation of my assets, mm -hmm. uh, I would say got to be the Teslas mm -hmm. because at one point in time, that was the highest valuation. Mm -hmm. Like my trading accounts, the most I've had our trading accounts is probably around like two hundred and fifty thousand mm dollars. -hmm. So, but this I've had more vehicles than that. So yeah, so I definitely say the 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 vehicles for me personally. Mm -hmm. But as far as a joint asset holding, mm -hmm. uh, Mustard Seed is mm -hmm. multi million dollar company. Mm -hmm. So that's still still was and still is mm -hmm. the number one. And we're actually expanding now to being in Cameroon as well mm -hmm. to do. Um, healthcare services as well in Cameroon. So it's only growing bigger and better. And that's our family backbone. We're trying to make sure that that's something that no matter what will leave for the next generations that is to come. So any any business deal that you that you regret or any business deal that, that you know you that you got in that you like I shouldn't have any? I don't think there's any deal I would say I've ever done that I regret because mm -hmm. the number one thing that a lot of people always forget is that you only learn from your mistakes. Mm -hmm. When you succeed at something, you just go back to it again. You're never really, you might improve, but it's never really like, man, I should have, or I did. Mm -hmm. So you learn the most from where you fail, but don't fail so hard to where you feel like you have to self-destroy. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I would say that because I always say, I'm glad I learned those mistakes from those mistakes to do them better the next mm -hmm. time. But if there's anything that I would point out is just like gambling. Mm -hmm. I mean, stocks is technically like kind of like gambling, but that's a calculated gamble, mm -hmm. right? But when you control no part of that gamble, I'm not really a gambler, but from time to time, I would be overzealous and just, but that's one thing that I say I, I control myself in, so I don't do that, but I would say that's the only place where mm -hmm. I would say don't gamble. Any, any advice for like the younger Clement or for like somebody right now who has a lot of, a lot of business in their head and they're coming up looking at, you know, capitalize on their ideas and some, some capital that they have? Yeah, man. The number one thing I tell a lot of people is we always want to think so big and it's never really that. Like I tell, this might be controversial right now. Like I tell some people like, don't look at Aliko Dangote because they always say, do what I say, don't do what I do. Mm -hmm. Because half the time you can't replicate what that man has done, mm -hmm. right? In their exact footsteps. But listen to what they're, 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 they're telling you to do. Mm -hmm. Start small. Like everybody knows an accountant nearby. Everybody knows a doctor nearby mm -hmm. who's been doing it for 30 years. Mm -hmm. Look at their, their steps. Like what do they do consistently? Go reach out to your chamber of commerce. Mm -hmm. But we always want to make it too complicated to go so big. But start really small. Start from the small people that are within your, your circle. And then it'll be very easy to grow from there because you can learn something key like, a big thing that I learned at one point in time was journaling. Mm -hmm. Just to be able to come back and look at my thoughts from that past day, I'm like, geez, boy, you thought this a year ago? You're mm -hmm. smart. Mm -hmm. And then that idea now is so much more defined in my head because I've been thinking about it over time. Mm -hmm. Or even just waking up at three o'clock to start my days because I work in Cameroon by three. That's eight o'clock in Cameroon time. Mm -hmm. So by the time everybody's waking up here, I'm literally already done with my day. Mm -hmm. So whatever else I'm doing here is a bonus. Mm -hmm. So things like that to where as a man, you have to always be ahead of the competition. Mm -hmm. And having a busy day like I do, I want to have as much hours as possible. So that way by nighttime, I'm not rushing to do work anymore. Whatever I'm doing is a bonus, mm -hmm. right? So those are the kind of few things that I learned from other people. But you have to just look at the people around your circle and find role model, talk to people, mm -hmm. right? Sit down with people and give them, hey, hey, yo, Flex, can I take you out to lunch? I just want to pick your brain on these ideas. Because mm -hmm. the only way you can learn is from other people's mistakes. Mm -hmm. Don't make the mistakes yourself. Learn from somebody else's mistakes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Clement, thanks for sharing. Man, I appreciate you. Every time you, you be taking me into deep thoughts that I didn't even think I had within me. So yeah. I'm, I'm glad to be on with you. Appreciate it.